so i'm pulling in madhavan of uh, bit of photography and there he is okay hi sudhir let's get started let's see i hope this stays and it works yes yeah, so, so far so good <laughs> okay so you were asking me about uh, some of my top 5 images i think that was one of the things what you had asked correct. me correct yeah correct so let me just uh, take you through it of course this we talked about it this was the cover shot and uh, this is the original image if you see one of my all Beautiful. favorite images and this was early morning which i shot in bharatpur and even today i remember this place the location the shoot absolutely fantastic and everything fell into place for me in this particular image i saw these two pelicans like swimming by and i saw the two darters at the back and i was like okay this is the shot what i want i waited and i have the sequence of images where first only one came then it went back and got the other one and they both lined up so nicely and like the vertical shot uh, the moment i shot i knew like this is going to be the cover shot of a magazine especially night view and one of my favorites and then the it's next very, one very... is beautiful i i just love this image and then yeah, the so next I, one it? next one is my Sorry. all time uh, favorite image of this tiger and the gaur and uh, this one uh, was an image i captured after waiting in the wild for close to 10 years this was my very first image of tiger in the wild i had never seen a tiger in the wild for close to 10 years and uh, this was the classic image this became extremely popular very popular and it even went on to become the cover shot of some magazines and at the same time went to the finalist of the bbc wildlife photographer of the year and uh, after this the other one which changed my life was of course this uh, of leopard course. on the tree and uh, this this was there for uh, close to 12 hours on the tree like this okay and this won me the sanctuary asia wildlife photographer of the year and this was one of those images which really prompted me to like get into full time photography teaching it made me quite popular whatever i had like that whole thing it increased even more and then the fourth image one of my favorite is this saurus crane from bharatpur so this again i spent close to 5 hours with this pair of saurus crane and then like i was able to get some absolutely beautiful shots of this it came so close and it was within minimum focusing distance and then i had to basically just keep the camera equipment aside and just keep looking at it it was so beautiful and it was very close both the pair and this is uh, obviously like an all time favorite image of mine and of course the last one is again of this portrait of a tiger where i mean like the way the look the feel everything this was in bandavgarh my very first visit to bandavgarh and absolutely fantastic absolutely fantastic these are my overall five top images you can say i mean like i just love this set of images beautiful beautiful all, all the pictures especially the the first image of course the national geographic uh, cover uh, that yeah. was absolutely stunning it won you the yellow border award can you just good. go back to that that image again uh, if 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 it's possible uh, oh yeah wonderful yeah so so an image like this is like once in a lifetime yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. it it just doesn't happen this this has so, never happened uh, again yeah so so there is something that i want to ask you you know uh while i photography especially you know calls for a lot of patience a lot of uh, disappointments because you know for you know i i was talking to steve winter you know the famous mm-hmm. na- national geographic uh, photographer uh, who uh, by the way for all the viewers steve winter has won a world press photo award uh, this time around in 2020 uh, but you know i met him in, in dubai and uh, he, he's a incredibly jolly guy you know so i was walking with him and you know he was talking about how disappointing sometimes you get with wildlife photography because <laughs> it's 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 it thousands of disappointments you really, you don't just get it you know and then suddenly something works you know and this this, this beautiful joyous image comes out of it you yes. know and it makes all the all those disappointments worth it so my question to you is this you know um wildlife photography cannot be without patience it cannot be without learning cannot be so that 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 bit of it is uh, obvious yes okay but what else does it take to shoot an image like this what does it take to to actually pr- to, to be in that space where you get an image like this see main thing obviously the number one point uh, if you want to be a better photographer better wildlife photographer is understanding animal behavior aspect i keep telling that a lot 
every single thing even when it comes to this uh, the leopard the award winning image right so this previous evening we saw this leopard with a kill on the tree and we knew that next morning it will hang around somewhere there itself because obviously in the tiger country the leopards generally don't like to walk around and if it is fed if it is completely fed there's no way it wants to walk around so we knew and we did not go anywhere else the next morning we directly drove and we came here and we got it okay so that is where if you see the number one thing patience is there beyond patience animal behavioral aspect even the saurus crane image if i have to talk about same thing if you try to approach these birds they will fly away any bird so there is something called as the circle of fear which means like every animal human being also if you see have the circle of fear if you suddenly enter the circle of fear the birds will either get disturbed they will fly away or they will attack you one of these things will happen so the best approach is for you to stay put so in this case that is what i did so i understood that these birds if you stay put at one place without disturbing them they will continue with their normal behavioral aspect okay in fact if you ask me the farmers who keep grazing in the farm right they are the best people for nature photography for bird photography because they are least bothered with the birds and the birds are least bothered with them they never tend to disturb them okay so usko uske hath mein you give a camera they can become fantastic photographers so such the that's the approach i took so i knew the behavioral aspect stay put and it took me almost one hour for these birds to come into the circle of fear way they accepted me and that is where i was able to get these kind of images so for wildlife photography apart from patience having a very good knowledge on photography knowledge on the behavioral aspect the natural history that is one of the most important thing and in fact a lot of people ask me saying what does it take to become a national geography photographer so there your photography skill is taken for granted that you know photography beyond that i think is the natural history your understanding about the whole environment itself and not just about the species that everything comes into picture and that i think is one of the most important aspects for any wildlife photographer if you ask me right how uh, uh, you know how do you prepare for going into a particular area this is my own personal photography that i'm talking about not for a educational uh, you know tour uh, with students but mm -hmm. i'm saying for your own photography how, how, what what is it that goes into the beginning of the tour how do you prepare for it what goes into your bag how do you decide so for that i have to share this image and mother one i don't know whether you remember this this was the image which was published in better photography around uh, yes, 8 do. years back <laughs> so <laughs> yes, the, the numbering so that image i just copied it the numbering is still there which was published of course this is a very right, old image right, this will right, right, right. so this gives you a perspective about how i prepared for a particular tour i mean like every single thing for me is important of course this entire thing has now shifted to sony uh, i don't have my latest image with a similar setup of the sony so i am still using my old image but if you see here right from small aspect like one of the things on the top left is basically a pouch of medicines okay so including medicines hard disk and then at the center right if you see the green color that is a baby toothbrush so i use the baby toothbrush to basically clean the equipment so one is like obviously multiple bodies multiple lenses now based on the destination so the way i prepare is i study i do a homework about like okay which is the location i'm going what kind of species what is the habitat over there based on that i carry this multiple equipment so for example like if i'm going to a place like bharatpur where i know my long tele lens is the one which is going to be used the maximum along with a 7200 kind of a range or a 100 400 so these are the only two equipment and i am not a person who does a lot of landscape photography so a wide angle lens i hardly carry but in the current scenario if you see for wide angle we have a cell phones i shoot with that yeah. so the number one is if you look at this layout so i make sure each of those things are ready so if this each of them i segregate some of them go into the camera bag and some of them go into the main suitcase itself for carrying around and then the habitat the animals and apart from that i contact the local drivers guides of the destination to figure out okay like what is currently happening over there which zone has maximum sighting what can we expect so they say like is tiger ne bacche de diye hai to wahan pe bacche khel rahe hai pani mein so this kind of yeah. information i get so i use this information to do the homework and then plan the execution of my shot basically so this is a basic 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 background study i do for the destination 
Right. So basically, uh, even calling up, even asking the drivers, or even asking the guides what is available yes. there before you actually even get there. Okay? So that is an important part of it, which I think a lot of us, uh, you know, who are um, aficionados of wildlife photography, but you know, we don't really ask this question to people. You know, <laughs> we just go there and then get told what to shoot, but you prepare for it. Absolutely. Uh, so two two additional questions come to mind. Uh, one, uh, which is actually something that I've seen you with, looking at some of the cameras, you know, in the in the thing, uh, it's a crazy, crazy rig setup that I've seen where you've taken two. Let's let me directly get to that. What you asked me about? Uh, go ahead. Yes, finish that yes, question. Yes. Okay, it's the most incredible setup that I have seen ever. Okay, in my life. Yeah, that is it. Now that that is insane because there are, there are actually two cameras that are that that are uh, rigged together, okay, from the tripod collars. Actually, I think is it bolted together? How are you using no. it? This one it's a crazy technique I came up uh, when I was in gear, where I wanted to shoot the lion portrait like it was very cooperative, and I kept on changing the lens. At one point, I was like, fine, let me try this out. So it is not on the tripod. So the way I shoot it is the way I use it is like. First, the 800 millimeter on the bean bag, and then if you see the lens collar, so the lens collar, the other lens collar of the 400 millimeter is on top of it. So the way I do it is I hold it together. This is all the support I give. So if you look at this image, the 800 is on the bean bag, 400 just sits on that. Okay, and at that point I just hold it in the hand, and because of the weight and the gravity, it just stays. it doesn't go anywhere and of course strict instruction to the driver guide no moving and then no starting the vehicle nothing so what i do is like i use the 800 so look through the viewfinder of the 800 i shoot the image and then immediately shift up and then shoot with the 400 so just i move it up and down i go up and down and in the fraction of a second i am able to move and this will actually give you a perspective of uh, the lion which i shot one with the 400 2.8 where it's a little bit portrait kind of a thing on the right side and with the 800 mm which is a much closer so obviously even from a cropping point of view the more closer i go if i want to go closer cropping the left one i should be able to do so this is a crazy technique i came up with the double decker technique and i have used it multiple times and even with the sony recently also with the sony 600 mm and the 200 600 once i used it basically keeping it on the bean bag just an experiment and i would not advise anybody to do this kind of a crazy thing <laughs> well i think that you know if there were other vehicles around you know the other jeeps uh, i am sure they must have got a knife they must have been actually watching you more than you know, watching the tiger you know, no, because yeah. of the kind of rig that so this once i did it in bandavgad also and people instead of watching the tiger they were like looking at me what is wrong with this guy like they were like definitely this camera is not his kisi se liya hai and it's okay if it falls also like he's least bothered that's the reaction they gave actually <laughs> okay so uh, just a question because i know this has happened to me as a photographer have you ever dropped a camera ha huh. multiple times <laughs> and uh, they all survived i think the newer camera have they all survived A lot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sudhir. There's a bit of an audio lag that's coming through. Being very patient. Oh yes, like I, I just hope this continues. We are able to finish the slide show. Uh, there's so much to talk about. All these places, everything. So let's see how it goes. <laughs> yes, you were speaking about your favorite places to shoot. Yeah. So in India, like of course, I keep traveling all over the world. But for me, in India, I just have three favorite locations. That is Kaziranga, Kana, and Kobet. And these slides will help you understand as to why is it that these are my favorite locations. And if you see, none of them are tiger centric for me. So these places I go mainly because of the habitat. And in all these years of me being visiting Kaziranga. only once i have been able to get the tiger only once just for those 5 seconds of it crossing this open area 
and the beauty about kaziranga is you have so many so much plenty of subjects to shoot of course we have what we call as the big five of kaziranga which is the elephant the tiger the wild buffalo the rhino and then the swamp deer these are the big five of kaziranga and the kind of backdrop what you get over there in kaziranga is absolutely fantastic and the rhinos over there are quite cooperative you can get very close to them get some very nice close up shots and then of course this is basically the bara singa so this is the soft coated bara singa which we get in uh, only in uh, kaziranga nowhere else we get it these are endemic only to kaziranga okay and also the backdrop which works over there in kaziranga if you see is absolutely fantastic for me in any Beautiful. form of photography it is always the background which makes or breaks the image and these these are the kind of images what you get and the kind of backdrop and uh, this is a very good location to shoot wow oops so again, i think we are having a little problem, problem okay. with the, the so again if you see audio. like with respect to the kind of backdrop what you get uh, oh again uh, because all the there is a big audio lag i can see the image quite well but there is a bit so of an audio call back let me call oh yeah so i missed the so kaziranga we saw the second favorite of mine is kana tiger reserve and if i quickly take you through people now will know why is it that i love kaziranga uh, love kana wow. tiger reserve mainly the backdrop what i get over there the grass meadows overall and then obviously the kind of lighting what we get okay and especially Beautiful. in winters in winters you get that red color carpet of grass at the backdrop and uh, this is the hard grown barasinga which is again endemic only to kana tiger reserve and one of my favorite images from kana is this tiger walking in that reddish pinkish kind of a grass even though i go to kaziranga uh, go to kana not for tigers but mainly for this barasingas and Beautiful. i'll tell you like Beautiful. this barasingas when they dress up like this in winters and in the early morning mist right it's absolutely fantastic and if you look at this Beautiful. this is what makes the image for me especially in winters wow. early morning mist and then the backdrop and you play around with your camera settings right you get this kind of amazing amazing scenes and uh, of course this is where your whole uh, understanding of photography comes into picture of playing around with the white balance and also other thing for kana is the kind of behavioral shots what you get and these spotted deers they are at very close quarters they don't run away they are not shy and that is what makes it for me and in the recent trip i was actually very lucky to get this specific shot of the tiger where it came oh, that is that is mark the tree and then it just walked off and i don't know how many of you are aware about kana and the famous tiger of kana which is munna that is the only tiger in the world so the name of the tiger is munna and that is the only tiger in the world which has a cat cat return on the forehead okay if you look at this oh, this yeah. is munna oh. so this is munna the very famous tiger of kana tiger reserve if you see on the forehead it is cat cat and here right. it is written right. pm so we call it the prime male okay so this is munna <laughs> it is like right. wow it's an amazing amazing one so that is about uh, uh, kana tiger reserve and my other most favorite is cobbet i was supposed to go april first week and because of all this issues it it got cancelled it's the habitat the landscape which i love about cobbet and of course when we talk about cobbet it has to be dikala because like if you have not seen dikala that means like you have not seen cobbet at all people go to bijrani and some of the other places and they complain that ah it was okay kind of a thing but the beauty of cobbet can be witnessed only in summers april may is the time april may is the basically oh, oh look at that beautiful come across these kind of hundreds of elephants in the open grassland that sure. is where is again my next destination next destination i mean like it's never ending the kind of images what you can make at corbett right with the early morning mist and then even the lighting 
the play of light and shadow and this elephants having mud bath dust bath if you see right and also apart from elephants even for the common subjects if you see it's an absolutely beautiful location and uh, of course apart from elephants the main tiger so this is the very famous parwali from uh, corbett tiger reserve so if you see overall kaziranga kana and corbett so these are the main main uh, parks for me where i go just not for tigers but just to get an overall feel of the whole forest and even in the month oh, of april early morning you have this kind of a mist so this is again corbett tiger reserve so this is where like kana kaziranga corbett are my three favorite locations and i mean like the kind of images as i say right this you can get it only in corbett you get that open grassland open area you can position the vehicle however you want because there are uh, tracks in this grasslands so you can go right go left in those tracks within the tracks itself you can position yourself and that's the reason like corbett is a favorite favorite destination of mine look at this beautiful beautiful so these to all these the viewers few things what i to all the viewers are watching this you know uh, i have been to a, to a few safaris uh, within national parks in india i've also been to safaris in in kenya uh, in particular in kenya um, and trust me there is a huge huge difference people aspire to go to kenya but indian national parks are simply brilliant you have to you have to really be there and experience it i would urge every single viewer who is here to you know to take the opportunity of going into one of the national parks but of course find the right time to go in and uh, sudhir was nice enough yeah. to share the perfect time and the places for this but please make it take the opportunity of going to one of these national parks for a safari because it will change your world view okay it will really change your world view you will see yes. what india the joy of india is you know it's, it's really amazing to see animals in their natural habitat in some of these places and it's very very different from anything anything that africa can offer india na indian national parks are incredibly beautiful uh, so the i've experienced yes, actually recently recently we were in pench in fact we were with uh, uh, jayan sharma over there uh, he was he was our mentor but um, uh, you know the it was so pristine and so beautiful i can't even begin to uh, i made some art photos of all the things Achha. i went to the wide angle lens and made some art photos from there which which oh, wow. is so or i i just felt so beautiful it is amazing just to be in the wilderness over there you know so i think yes. everyone should experience this please help to experience this please get in touch with uh, sudhir ask him for of course we are stuck in covid 19 and we are there but whenever it opens <laughs> up do take a tour with sudhir because he'll plan it out for you you know so absolutely uh, and uh, and i just want to share some of these images i was talking to you about the images from the entry level camera like just to encourage yeah. uh, the beginners that it's not necessary you need to have high end equipment even from an entry level you should be able to get good images so of course some of these images are from my friend swaroop like we traveled together for wildlife and uh, a lot of these images are hers and of course with her permission sharing these images i mean like this is from the entry level that 18000 rupees kit camera what i said from the 1200d and the 55 to 50 lens i mean like look at it's it's always the composition which actually matters a lot even in masai mara if you see the kind of compositions what you can play around with again from bandavgad and this is rantambore again the canon 1200d 55 to 50 lens so if you see like it's more of the techniques which actually matters a lot more than anything okay so make sure don't run behind equipment get your technique right and as i keep saying even from an entry level camera you can make some absolutely amazing image and this is one of our award winning images again shot from this entry level kit camera where you see the tiger with the plastic cover in its mouth it's a chips packet okay so this is in the zone 6 of rantambore and this is the current state of affairs when it comes to environment of our forest like there's so much of littering happen in the forest and obviously like this animals be it like tigers or spotted deer or samba deer they eat up these plastics and sometimes like it causes even their death so these are powerful images as you see it's not about the equipment but mainly to do with your techniques composition that is what you need to really really work on Right. Uh, so the uh, just a quick question regarding a little bit of technique. Yeah. Um, so if you had to choose, I know wildlife photographers all have their favorite way of using their cameras. 
but if you had to choose let's say two uh, things that you would want to control in your camera absolutely control in the camera today's cameras are uh, have a so much of automation built in yeah okay, so let's say there are two things that you would want absolute control over what would those two features of a camera be uh exposure compensation is one of the most important things for me because depending on what metering you are using the overall tonality of the image you can control it with exposure compensation in fact uh, me and kalyan long time back we were giving the presentation and people asked us saying in wildlife photography which is the mode you use the maximum aperture priority shutter priority manual which is the mode and together our answer was we always shoot in exposure compensation mode because that is one <laughs> okay. thing that is one thing yeah. where overall image tonality the play of light and shadow if it is there controlling that entire thing everything i always do with my exposure compensation that is one obvious setting and other one is to make sure we get decent shutter speed in aperture priority i always play around with iso so iso and then the exposure compensation these are two things i always want to have control over when it comes to camera settings so that would be my preference so uh, one of the videos that you had uploaded was also about the back focus button you know so could you just could you just uh, talk a little bit about the back focus button and um, how it is unlinked with how f- focus is unlinked with from the shutter button uh, at that point of time and you know it's relegated to the back focus button the back the back uh, back button yeah. focusing yeah yeah back yeah. button focus that side right. yeah so uh, in most of your cameras like at the back of the camera you have the af button now what i have done in the past of course once i moved to sony uh, the kind of auto focusing it has i don't use the back button at all but yes in the dslr that is one of the most powerful features so there what we do is like we disengage the shutter button from auto focusing okay so the disadvantage what happens is basically like when you're trying to focus when you press the shutter release button for auto focus you want to do the recomposition sometimes you will not be in a position to move the auto focusing button fast or the auto focusing points you can't move it faster okay so that is where that That's is where like the uh, uh, what you call locking the focus and recomposing with the back button it happens absolutely fantastic okay that is one major advantage and i don't have to shift from one shot to the servo mode or afs to basically afc mode i don't have to switch around so with the back button focusing i use it for use it as one shot also because if you don't press the back button focusing it will not focus so i look at the subject i press the back button once it achieves focus i leave it and then i can easily recompose because the focus is locked at that and french right. shutter release button you just press it and you basically get the exposure and the other third right. important reason is the uh, manual focus override so if you are not able to get auto focusing immediately you will have to move to manual focusing if the subject is behind some bushes so there you don't have the time to switch from auto focus to manual focus because what happens is in normal case even if you override and do the manual focus and then when you press the shutter release button to click it will again reengage the auto focusing so whatever yeah Correct. whatever manual focus you have done that will go away but in case of back button focusing since i don't press the back button at all so when i focus it manually shutter release is just for click it will not auto focus so that is where again the major advantage is so this is where when it comes to action photography using the back button as one shot and servo mode ai servo or afs and afc this flexibility it's a lot when it comes to the back button focusing and uh, all these years when i was on canon i used to use that meticulously every single time and i never switch to a uh, one shot at all because that was the most powerful feature when it comes to back button focusing right with sony of course it's different with sony uh, you are saying that the auto focus is actually pretty good uh, so you don't engage the back uh, af button at all no just the front button itself because the flexible spot uh, what we have in sony that auto focusing once it locks on the tracking is absolutely fantastic so i don't use the back button it has a back button focusing af on it has but i never use it so the flexible shot expansion flexible shot is what i use in sony and that is fantastic is brilliant like even to the corner of the frame the auto focusing point can go and it can track the subject and uh, of course the other benefit of uh, the sony's auto focusing is it has the eye control animal eye control focusing 
and that also right. i've tested it it works brilliantly especially like if the subject is moving if the animal is moving and the eye is visible right it locks on focus over there so of so when they move the show the fourth generation of cameras of absolutely cameras. absolutely yes and i see that uh, both of them are uh, not only sony even canon others also are basically putting up these features okay okay yeah uh, one of the things that you know uh, and this would be my last question actually uh, sudeep uh, so one of the things that you know a lot of uh, photographers wildlife photographers who are stuck at home today you know there's, mm. there's no option um, right you know so what would be your advice to them especially with regard to wildlife photography around their homes around the windows you know how is it that they can take this forward where they are right now um one thing is obviously like all said and done we have to accept the fact accept the fact that wildlife photography is expensive that is a matter we have to accept that said still people who have this like entry level cameras for them my main advice is don't look at all the high profile parks with bandhavgad rantambor these are all very expensive parks especially like the safari cost itself the travel to that place the stay fine you can somehow manage but the safari entry to some of the hot zones within rantambor yes. bandhavgad is very expensive we have to take that into consideration so find out what are those other parks close to your place say if we talk about bharatpur i mean except with the big cats bharatpur has every single subject right from neel gai to spotted deer to sambar deer to jackals to hyenas to pythons races macaques uh, i mean like every single thing even with the birds so and on foot you can explore over there and the entry fee is hardly what like 95 rupees or something like that for the entire day and you can hire your own rickshaw or on cycle you can go around okay and traveling to bharatpur obviously like train connectivity is really good you can get to bharatpur accommodation even at just 500 rupees per night you can get very decent accommodation in bharatpur so if you see travel cost accommodation park entry you can go around in your own cycle okay if you see the overall cost it's very very less and there is abundant opportunity opportunity to practice and the best part about bharatpur is right from morning 6:30 till evening 6 for almost those full 12 hours you can be inside the park and there is food facility available inside the park so you don't even have to come out okay so people asking about kabini bandipur these are all expensive places so people entry level you want to get started with wildlife photography there are these destinations there are these locations where at a very less cost a fraction of the cost of this high profile parks you can practice so other thing is keep going to the same place over a period of time bharatpur itself if you take you keep going to the same place you will start understanding about the animal behavior and one thing about nature i tell you the same species same bird will always be at the same place irrespective of when you go and every bird they have a time which it maintains i mean people in uh, uh, bharatpur we know there is the sunset point at the sunset time when we go there there is this particular darter which comes and sits on the specific pole with the sun setting at the back that is a common thing even uh, if you look at this cobbet one this is every evening this is a common scene it happens day in day out okay so that is where spend your time understanding about the subjects understand about the location the behavioral aspect and i take it for granted that the foundation when it comes to photography the core fundamental concepts of camera settings other things that is something you can't get away with so that is the core foundation based on that beyond that get into these core aspects of understanding the behavior animals location keep visiting the same place again and again and i'm guaranteeing you in a matter of 3 to 6 months you can surpass any entry level photographer but yes that patience dedication perseverance is very very important uh thank you so much uh, sudhir because we have i'm trying to look for the uh, you know some of the questions that people have yeah. asked So I think we can no, open so. up, uh, guys. Uh, whatever you have, uh, you can start asking questions. So somebody is asking in Bharatpur, hundred four hundred is not sufficient. I can guarantee you, even with the hundred four hundred lens, you can get absolutely amazing images at Bharatpur. Everything is about composition. You need to have an eye for that, and you start practicing more on composition, different aspects of composition. That is something which you have to study. Okay. 
and uh, somebody navin asking how to get the red sunset images it's about white balance okay so if you want to get this kind of uh, uh, image if you see like i have multiple of this sunset sunrise image and even this early morning mist shoot in uh, again corbett uh, if you see this is where you need to play around with your white balance so this kind of an orangish yellowish tone if you want to get then i always go with a white balance of 10000 kelvin and that will give you this kind of a beautiful color so that is i can see all these are basically techniques which you have to understand again the kana tiger reserve if you look at these images each of these images sunrise sunset images right you have to play around with white balance and of course there is this other extreme if you want to give it a totally different mood okay so this again if you see 10000 kelvin a totally different one early morning at 2500 kelvin you get more of the bluish cast in the image so it gives a different mood in the image so same thing you can shoot at 10000 shoot at 2500 so it's all about playing with composition playing with the camera setting and then trying to get what you want actually in the image so i have a question to the regarding this now do you actually make these settings on the fly on the go while you're shooting or do you do it, do it in post uh, in the raw a uh, majority of the time i go with the concept of pre visualization so i know like okay at this location these are the kind of images i get and especially like early morning late evening i know if this is what i want to create then this is the white balance i have to use so 90% of the time i put all the settings in the camera in the field and in post processing hardly i do any work of course post processing i bring out that punch with respect to better contrast colors vibrance so some of those i keep changing it but 90% of the setting i always do it in the field i mean a lot of people they always think in the field are chalo isko mai processing mein kar deta hu so that is a very bad way to think because sometimes if you use the wrong setting and in post processing also you cannot recover or make those corrections so my advice always do it right the first time in the field in the camera itself okay so there is a question by arun photography aditya who says what do you think of manual uh, versus auto iso okay now this is where the advanced uh, setting comes into picture now what happens is even if you completely put it just in auto iso so another way to shoot is you can go into the shutter priority mode and then choose what shutter you want shutter speed you want and go in auto iso to get a particular shutter speed now there what happens in case if you just keep it open ended the auto iso chances are even in good lighting your camera may end up giving you very high shutter speed very high iso with noise and the image quality will go down now that is where this advanced setting in your camera where you can put a cap on the highest iso what the camera will use in case of auto iso so all like canon nikon sony every camera have this setting where you go in and say like in case of auto iso what is the maximum iso i will allow the camera to use go and set a cap saying okay and that is where again what i call the shootable iso of a camera you have to find out where you go in and see like particular camera model 2000 iso 4000 iso what is the quality it gives you see like okay 2000 it gives good quality but the moment you go to 3000 it the quality is compromised then put the cap at iso 2000 saying in auto iso never go beyond iso 2000 so that if you put in the advanced mode then yes auto iso you can use it compared to manual iso it's even preferable i would say wouldn't yes uh, yes but that's when you control everything yeah? otherwise yep. you will not uh, get the kind of yeah there is a, uh, a question which is also something that you know i would like to ask by irfan ashraf you know what is the best way to keep your camera and lenses safe for a moisture especially when you when you are not shooting i'm not using your equipment um so he says that he is using the small salt like packs that are present yes. in the new shoe boxes yes. that is of course not salt in there uh, ashraf it's a silica uh, gel uh, ashraf, the silica gel yeah. silica gel Yeah. So, so did how do you how do you protect your gear? See, in my case, what I do is like see, even if you take Bangalore city where there is not much humidity, the important fact is do not keep it closed in an almira. In fact, long time back, I had kept uh, one of my binoculars inside an almira for a very long time, and complete fungus came into picture, and it just like gone. It was it's gone for a toss. So, what I do is like obviously like I have shelves here, completely open shelves. Okay, so in the open shelf, I keep the camera equipment. Even here, also, if you see down here, my 600 mm uh, lens is just lying over there with the camera. I keep things in the open. 
so do not keep it inside closed almirahs for a long time so even during this uh, shutdown period so my advice of course uh, in places like uh, chennai kolkata bombay where uh, there is sea shore and there's a lot of humidity and salt content in the atmosphere right there you need to go with the case hard case uh, not the case uh, 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 what do you call those containers uh, humidifiers basically so dehumidifiers mm-hmm. you need to go with that and then like Digi, obviously digi cabi is a good brand the digi cabi yeah. is usually the brand that that is being that is used right so digi cabs you can use and if you are not able to spend too much of money then in your almira keep it open but put a small zero watt bulb so basically there has to be heat warmth for that humidity not to come in so this is the care i take when it comes to equipment keeping it for a long time without using it okay basically uh, fungus loves the dark it it loves uh, dark environments more than it it loves loves light you know light it drives away fungus Uh, the ultraviolet and the light, in fact, kills fungus uh, pretty fast. Uh, Absolutely. The problem Absolutely. is when you keep it closed inside an uh, inside a, a closed environment, which is why the, even the digi cabbies have a transparent front. There is a light, there is a lamp inside these uh, digi cabby, and they are humidity controlled, uh, humidity controlled environments. But basically, right. the idea is to keep using it and keep it out in the open. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. There is a question by Sri Ram Photography. What is the maximum ISO that you have used, with which you've got a wonderful shot? I think I have used long time back as an experiment uh, with the Sony. I have gone up to one lakh fifty thousand ISO with decent result. Long time back. Okay, that was again for experiment. But in normal situation, I have gone up to like twelve thousand five hundred ISO, with still very decent uh, result. And in Sony. Uh, overall like so far i've gone up to 5000 plus iso because uh, i never had to go beyond that given the lighting situation but even at 5000 plus iso which is the max i have used so far in sony i got some decent uh, results uh, overall so far so we will take just one more question uh, that's the final question because um, uh, there are a lot of questions regarding gear that is coming through uh, okay. but these are questions i think that you know if if you uh directly interact with um uh with sudhir you will be able to get the answer um i think uh let's look for one last question yeah um there is a question that has just come up in india which is a good thank you for wireless sudhir has already yeah. answered that question please go to the igtv of uh, sudhir's channel or better photography and just take a look at that answer because it's a good question and there are, there is a good answer there for you right so now again there is a question again regarding entry level uh someone has asked a question saying that my auto focusing is not good enough in especially in entry level dx uh, body so what can i do about that so this See, is the last uh, question that we will take uh, so yeah. these so uh, you know so last question that we will answer and then we will wrap up yeah so if you ask me uh, madhavan one of the common face issue with entry level is auto focusing because if you understand how auto focusing works you 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 go into in depth about the different auto focusing sensors for each of the auto focusing point what you have so be it the cross type non cross type dual cross type different kind of auto focusing technology is available and unfortunately in the entry level camera you will maximum have the non cross type which is the slowest auto focusing point in the camera and mostly the center auto focusing point will be cross type and again depending on what lens you use if it is a 5.6 lens combined with this kind of a body then you can forget about auto focusing in low light situation or action photography now that is where the compromise comes into picture regarding the cost of the equipment and then what you want to shoot and that is one of the most important reasons why the high end cameras be it the sony a9 a9 mark 2 the nikon d5 or the canon 1dx series what you have they are so expensive because of the auto focusing technology the kind of auto focusing technology what they use so entry level that is the compromise that is the trade off you cannot expect faster auto focusing in entry level cameras and we have to live with that but at the same time you are also saying that you know if you really can't do wildlife photography or get those particular kind of frames or composition correct with entry level cameras you cannot you know advanced cameras really cannot help that's also something yeah. that you maintain isn't it 
absolutely absolutely so uh, with that i think thank you sudhir we shall close this it's been a long session uh, yes. thank you everyone uh, we have a fair number of viewers still watching uh, thank you everyone everyone for bearing with all the drop offs and the, the you know the visual quality issues and the uh, and you know the every time that we have restarted the live um, yes. thank you very much for watching there's one last message uh, sudhir that i would like to give to all the photographers who are viewing our channel Uh, the covid-19 situation of course is something that has affected all of us uh, but there are many many of our heroes the health yes. workers you know the doctors the photographers including photographers who uh, are on the front lines who are bringing us images uh, they are the media people you know who are bringing us news all these people we need to remember them and we need to entirely um, say kudos to all of them for yes. for being there for us you know we are sitting at home we are doing all these live sessions it's a wonderful time to learn but let's not also forget that there are all those people out there who are putting their uh, taking enormous risks risks to to you know be on the front lines and fight uh, this virus uh, on our behalf almost you know so uh, hats off hats off to all of all of you all guys uh, the second thing is that uh, let us be very compassionate to those people who work in our homes but who are not unable to come to a house uh, let us ensure that their their families are also safe yes. so let as photographers uh, you know let us let us support those who depend on us and those whom we depend on who can't really come let it's, it's a message that i'm giving at all all my all the sessions that that i am having with with all photographers because because as photographers we need to be compassionate so Absolutely. please stay safe stay stay safe uh, stay indoors and stay compassionate Uh, thank you sudhir thank you very much it's been a real thank you real madhavan pleasure. thank you madhavan thank you so much and yes i would like to thank the viewers with so much of these issues uh, so probably like one thing i'm realizing is like my phone used to become very hot and this this issue used to happen and since the time i put on the ac it's actually very cold in here but the fortunately phone is working so that's a small <laughs> workaround i think i need to keep in mind but yeah that said uh, yes thanks a lot to the viewers for uh, coming back uh, each time we got disconnected again we had to start the live session so thank you so much for that and we apologize for uh, all those uh, technical issues what we had and beyond that yes i fully agree with madhavan uh, at these times i think like apart from supporting our own family uh, especially even in my case uh, the home uh, maid and other workers who come to our home right nobody is coming but we are ensuring that they get the monthly salary because the salary uh, the small yeah. amount a small amount right. of 2000 3000 rupees probably like the, may not mean too much for us but for them it matters a lot every single house where they used to go they are not able to come to work so we are making sure for all the housemaid who are not able to come we are continuing to pay the salary so february it's uh, march we stop so march april may so we are making sure we continue to pay the salaries so these are all the small small contributions staying at home what we can do and yes uh, as you rightly said like uh, we have a lot of those frontline warriors out there fighting this covid for us and the best thing we can do is currently go with the guidelines what the government are saying stay at home stay safe be with your family and together i think we should be able to overcome this challenge and with that thank you so much we'll close this session and madhavan it's been fantastic to talking to you and uh, hopefully like we will come up with more sessions different kind of sessions going forward absolutely and uh, absolutely. let's see we'll keep in touch uh, stay in touch absolutely okay. let's let's do this again at some point yep okay thanks uh, everybody thank you, thank you for thank joining you. take care bye thank bye you. have a fantastic evening we'll close the session thank you thank you bye 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 bye, bye everyone